Dr. Ray Dionandon is an epidemiologist at the University of Ottawa who specializes in global health. He joins me now. Uh, Dr. Dionandon, first of all, thanks for taking time to speak with me today. Appreciate it. My pleasure. So we are starting to see this stubbornly high case count in many parts of the country. And in some cases, what seems like a refusal to follow the health orders and restrictions being put in place in some of those provinces. Why do you think that is? What do you think is happening? A lot of things going on. Number one, there I think there was a miscommunication early on where people got the idea that this was a one and done. Back in June, when the first wave was over, we thought we were done with this. That was never the case. This is always going to be a multi-month, possibly years-long endeavor. So that's the first thing. Second is pandemic fatigue is a real thing, right? So people are getting tired of the restrictions. They want to socialize back. I understand that. Third is that we're dealing with another epidemic, and that is an epidemic of misinformation and active disinformation. Mm -hmm. Misinformation includes things like we already have herd immunity, or it's not that serious, or it's a case-demic, or it's even a hoax. And the disinformation is people pushing that narrative from some political quarter or other for whatever agenda. So all combined, it's causing people not to be compliant with the social uh, guidelines that we put forth in, um, by public health leaders. And that's a problem. So when we had originally planned for how to deal with epidemics and pandemics, nobody ever anticipated there would be so much pushback mm -hmm. on the plans. And we didn't anticipate that there would be, again, active misinformation and disinformation. So that's a new thing we're going to have to figure out. Okay, let, let me unpack some of that because there's, there's a lot in that. The, the Prime Minister made the case today that uh, you, you talked a little bit about uh, communication and messaging and so on. He, he made the case today that, look, the messaging is different in different parts of the country uh, because the situation is different in different parts of the, com uh, the country. Some places facing a bigger problem than others. So he says we can't have a one-size-fits-all message. So, so do you believe that's right? It's definitely right that this isn't just one epidemic. It's multiple epidemics with different faces depending upon the population and geography we're talking about. What's wrong, though, is that some things are universal. One, it's a real disease. Two, it can be dangerous at the community level. And three, it's not a hoax, right? And four, this is a multi-month endeavor. So those messages have been lost along the way, and that's not subject to geographical variation. Right. So what is a, if you're the prime minister of this country, what do you do about that? He's, he's taking some of the heat. Uh, for what's happening across the country, although a lot of this, as we know, is, is provincial jurisdiction. But people look to the federal government for leadership in these kinds of things. What else can he say? Well, there's not a lot he can say at this point. We can look back at the failures in the past and think about how we can better deploy our tools for the future. But this reminds me that this is a crisis in civics as well. So, so much of this is an inability to understand that my actions affect you. It's the butterfly effect work large. And I think that is a useful message to explore, the fact that we are all responsible for each other. Each other. And this is not about individual risk, it's about community risk. That narrative, I think, is largely missing from the national picture. Hmm. Uh, he, he re he, I think he reintroduced it today. At one point, he was talking about, look, we, uh, we need to sort of uh, ask ourselves, really, are we that good of a neighbor? I mean, he's really calling on Canadians to think about exactly what you're talking about, personal actions. And I'm, uh, I'm wondering, you know, whether uh, you think the, the population is open to that message now or whether the fatigue, uh, the fatigue factor might be so big that, you know, you'll have a lot of people saying, you know, whatever, uh, I'm not sick. Uh, the people I know aren't sick, so I'm not worried about this. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I think that's a concern for a lot of people. It is, but I think Canadians, for the most part, are fairly community-minded, especially compared to, let's say, the Americans. It's just that this disease doesn't tolerate a lot of dissent in the sense that, you know, 5, 10, 15 percent of people don't go along with it. That's fairly intolerable because that can cause some super spreading events. So what do we do about those 5, 10, 15 percent who don't care about their neighbors? Well, for them, a different strategy has to be employed. And I like the idea of explaining that this is a marshmallow experiment. If you can wait a few more months before socializing, you get more marshmallows, you get an open economy, you get to socialize more. So again, that trade-off has not been fully explained. Uh, you talked about the misinformation and disinformation. Have governments and health leaders in this country um, been effective at getting out the message against a growing social media campaign by some groups and individuals, as you point out, pumping out misinformation and din disinformation, telling Canadians, look, uh, this is not a real thing, it's a hoax, it's a government-sponsored uh, uh, pandemic and not to worry about it. Uh, how do they deal with that and have they been doing a good job so far? 
in my opinion, they have not been doing a good job, but I'm sympathetic because they didn't expect to have to fight this uh, battle and the communications budgets and resources aren't meant for this kind of thing. So as a result, citizens have had to step up and create little collectives for actively combating misinformation. The problem is that science by YouTube video is more reachable, more accessible than science by peer reviewed paper. And unfortunately, science by peer reviewed paper is more accurate. So what we need to do is use the tools of misinformation, use the social media, use the infographics, use the easy messaging to combat the misinformation. And again, uh, the resources aren't there yet. And hopefully we can get our act together quickly to make it happen. How concerned are you that uh, we will continue to see cases rise or stay uh, uh, too high for comfort? Um, where do you think we are in, in that process, uh, let's say, over the next couple of weeks? Uh, how pivotal is this time? It's pretty pivotal. So much of the country is below healthcare overwhelming status. I mean, there's room at the inn, as some people say, but we're getting to the point where we might be overwhelmed, right? So this is never about mass deaths on the street. It's always been about overwhelming of our healthcare system, and certain parts of the country are feeling the strain. So the next couple of weeks are kind of critical to setting the stage for what happens in the long, dark, cold winter when the flu cases start to rise and when hospitalizations might go up. So it's very important for people to diminish their socializing so that those hospitals do not get overwhelmed. And yet, in some cases, uh... Um, there are some simply threatening to ignore orders. Look at, look at what's happening. Some private gym operators in the province of Quebec ready to defy the restrictions. Um, and the Premier of Quebec saying today, look, if they do, we'll fine not only them, but we'll fine the people who go and use the gyms. Uh, is that the right approach? It's a tough call, right? Public health is in many ways a game of incentives and disincentives. It's carrot and stick. And the messaging has been mostly stick at this point, you know, scolding people for being bad about socializing and then deploying the big stick, which is the law and finding. We haven't explored the carrot. What's the carrot here? The carrot is if you do these few things, then maybe we can get an open economy in a few weeks or months and you can make back your money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't do these things, this goes on much longer and there's more suffering. That has not been adequately explained or mapped out for people. So it would be useful if we had a longer term plan that could be explained to the population right, and then fill, fill it with some confidence and an incentive again to go along with the plan. Right. Um, why do you think that's been a failure? Why, is, it, is it because it's something we haven't dealt with before and, and it's all so new or do you think uh, it's more, it, there's something more to it? That's part of it. It's definitely new. Also, we're not used to in the West planning for more than a few weeks and even months in the future. Definitely not years. This is something anathema to our planning process. So we have to think long term now. Unfortunately, we're sort of, you know, putting all our uh, all our hopes on a vaccine. And the vaccine is coming without question. It's just that it may not come in a few weeks. It will take months and it'll take even months longer to deploy it and to get an immunogenic response, et cetera. So if we can get that timeline straightened out and put together a plan and explain it to the people that this is how we're going to do this, expect the vaccine you know, around this time of the year, expect uh, this delay in deploying, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think we'll get a lot more buy-in. All right, lots to watch, uh, lots to think about as well. Dr. Ray Dionandon, thanks so much for your time today. Appreciate it. Thank you.